Well, today, as we know, marks the first Sunday in the penitential season of Lent, a time set apart to pray, to reflect, and prepare for sharing the journey of Jesus through Holy Week to resurrection. Any journey, especially that involving discipleship and genuine struggle, and the genuine struggle that that entails, requires preparation. Lent has been observed in some form since at least the second century AD, when a period of 40 days was observed as a preparation for Easter, which was also the day on which baptism would take place for new initiates after they had been through literally years of preparation and participation in the life of the Christian community, when all Christians would renew their faith in and their commitment to their risen Lord. The number 40 also has always had special biblical significance regarding preparation. We remember that on Mount Sinai, preparing to receive the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus tells us that Moses stayed there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights without eating any food or drinking any water. Elijah, we're told, walked 40 days and 40 nights to the mountain of the Lord, Mount Horeb, another name for Mount Sinai in 1 Kings. But most importantly, Jesus fasted and prayed 40 days and 40 nights in the desert before he began his public ministry. It is this time of apartness in the wilderness that Lent echoes, and why it is the first gospel reading for this season. For Jesus, his journey of sonship, his ministry, begins at baptism. But he doesn't then set off with newfound confidence to change the world. In fact, quite the opposite. We're told that, full of the Holy Spirit, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. His calling can only be fulfilled if he is ready to surrender all to it and dedicate himself totally to God. And knowing how this will be achieved requires reflection, discernment, prayer, and struggling with the options and temptations that such a calling would evoke. And so the Spirit of God sends him into the wilderness, in ancient times a place regarded as a place of encounter with God. For Jesus, this is a necessary time of preparation, of discernment of God's will, and a test of the direction that his ministry and his messiahship would take. Now, the location of the temptations is important. I've just mentioned this before, so you might be familiar with it. The traditional site of the temptations is a steep-sided, tall mountain on the Jordan Valley escarpment, overlooking Jericho at the top end of the Dead Sea. It's a tiring climb to the summit from where, overlooking the Jordan Valley, you can see, if we're talking forward, you're looking east, left, you're looking north, right, you're looking south, behind, you're looking west. So looking left, you can see north towards the fertile region of Galilee, the home of Jesus and where he has friends. Behind one, from the summit of this mountain, you can see in the distance, 18 miles across the desert hills, way in the distance, as the crow flies, the summit of the Mount of Olives, the other side of which lies the city of Jerusalem, the center of religious and secular authority. And below this mountain lies the fertile oasis of Jericho, with lush fruit, olive, and palm groves, and the luxurious winter palaces and gardens of the Rhodian kings and governors, which were there in Jesus' time, and which the ruins of which you can still see today, which are still visible there today. The geography allows an interesting analogy of the options for his ministry. Standing on that mountain, the, those options are laid before him. Should he go back to his homeland, establish his ministry amongst friends, 
on the fringes of Jewish society and at that point of encounter between cultures and religions. After all, Galilee was on the edge of Gentile territory and right on the trade routes between Asia and Egypt and between Europe and Arabia. Should he first go to Jerusalem, the seat of religious and political power, and confront the religious and political injustices of the day? Or given the status that God has afforded him, should he seek the power and the wealth that the palaces and the city of Jericho laid out before him represented? We are familiar with those temptations. First, he could use the God-given power and status to fulfill his own personal needs. To turn stones to bread would do just that. But more than that, it would have two other effects. It would only be a temporary response to a physical need, and it would entice people to follow him. But rather, it is the causes of physical, social, and spiritual hunger that need to be addressed. Notice that when he does miraculously feed people by the Sea of Galilee, this is not done as a miracle to garner support, but rather as a sign of discipleship, of faith, and of shared responsibility. In the second temptation, Jesus is urged to perform a miraculous act to earn people's immediate response. People are hungry for spectacle and performance. Has humanity changed much? But great actions are soon forgotten when the next attraction comes along. Faith in the superficial is not real, nor can it sustain us through the difficulties and the struggles of daily living. And that other temptation affects us all to seek wealth, power, and status. Looking down at the Herodian palaces and guardian, gardens, this would surely be a natural temptation. But of course it's true that the more we acquire, the more we want. And as we acquire more, it's easy to move further away from living our lives according to the things and values that really matter or giving time to those things that have a deeper meaning and put us in touch with God, who is there, always present, waiting to be encountered in the silence, in the simple things, in the mystery of nature, in the joy of love, in the simplicity, of, in the simplicity or the space of simplicity, or even in the emptiness of the desert. No wonder the desert was regarded as a place of encounter with God where nothing can distract us from our dependency upon him. That's why monasticism was born in the deserts of the Middle East. Lent is a time to take ourselves into that spiritual desert, to detach ourselves from those things which get between us and him and to rediscover his closeness to us. In Lent, we are reminded of our baptismal promises invited to repent of where we have gone wrong and reflect on God's ongoing purpose for our lives. Such times of spiritual stillness, quiet, and being alone with God are essential for our spiritual growth and our relationship with him. And yet, in the modern world, time and stillness are two things that aren't they the hardest to find? Is it a surprise that so often we seem to have lost touch with God, even though he never loses touch with us. That's very important. Even when we think we lose touch with God, he never loses touch with us. Those words in Romans, I think, are really profound. Um, that simple phrase, the word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. How often do we really reflect on that and say the word, the spirit of God is near you, so often we don't discern that. Today's readings afford an opportunity to reflect on what are the temptations that distract us from our journey of faith and limit our faithfulness to Christ or our diligence in discipleship. The temptations that the Spirit sends to Jesus in him have universal significance, but are also ones that to some degree we are all susceptible we want the easy way out. We desire to meet our own needs above all others. 
We desire popularity, wealth, or influence. But Jesus shows us the way and sets the path that we are called to follow. The very gift of life means that we will be tested. That testing can be a source of despair if we haven't learned to discern the presence of God. But if we have taken the time to know him, then we will know that God is with us, that he does carry us through whatever temptations, even whatever struggles we may face, and that ultimately he brings us through perhaps at times a rocky wilderness path to a destination of light and joy and peace. Beyond crucifixion, always lies resurrection, however difficult that path may be. It's when we are like Jesus in the wilderness, but put our dependence on God and remain open to him, that we receive the grace and the strength to respond to his call and be witnesses ourselves of his grace and love in the world. And that's what ultimately the journey of Lent invites us to achieve and to share beyond the struggle of our daily lives, beyond the daily temptations, to go beyond it all, to journey with Christ, to let him take our hands, our hearts, and our souls, and journey with him to the ultimate glory. Amen.